For the kickoff, the 18th Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, Khalif O. Wright. Chief Wright represents the highest enlisted level of leadership, providing direction for the enlisted force while representing their interests to the American public and all levels of government. He serves as a personal advisor to the Chief of Staff and the Secretary of the Air Force regarding topics of welfare, readiness, morale, and proper utilization and progress of the enlisted force. Chief Wright began his enlisted career in March of 1989 in the dental career field. His work ethic and dedication to effective leadership is highlighted through his vast experience serving as a superintendent in four different squadrons and the command chief in four different wings, task forces, and a major command. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, Khalif O. Wright. All right, good evening. Man, is this like a Turkish Turkish carpet? No. No? <laughs> this is nice. <laughs> All right. Um, well, first, let me say uh, thank you for the invite. This is NCLS has quickly become uh, my absolute favorite conference to attend. Uh, I really uh, I got to attend last year and, and spent some time with uh, with with you during this event and then uh, a subsequent uh, subsequent uh, speaking engagement. And uh, so I was really excited uh, when I got to come back this year. I almost didn't make it. I had another uh, thing that I was supposed to do, but uh, I kind of waved that off and waved that off to make sure that I could be here with you guys uh, this evening. So, again, thank you so much for the invite. I'm really looking forward to this week, I'll get to enjoy really the entire conference this time as I'll be here through uh, Saturday evening. What I, what I, Saturday morning, what I thought I would do with the time that we have together this evening is uh, maybe tell you a little bit about what I've been up to as, as your chief, uh, what I plan to try to accomplish in uh, my last days as your chief. So this is my uh, last hurrah. Uh, this fall around September, I'll transition uh, out of the Air Force after 32 years. It's been 32 long years. But I really would, lead, would, would love to leave the brunt of the time that we have together to answer any questions that you might have to kind of see what's, what things are on your mind, what you might be thinking about, what things I can, I can help you with. Uh, before we start, let me just give a shout out to, I thought I saw uh, our 12 Outstanding Airmen of the Year here, yeah? <laughs> So Rowdy, Rowdy Bunch. And uh, I don't know if uh, Cadet Robinson is here. Adrian, is Adrian here? Yeah. All right, yep. It's like my nephew there. And uh, what about Sarah? Sarah, are you here? Cadet Macenter. No, yes? Okay. Um, So as you can imagine, uh, we at the Pentagon and at Headquarters uh, Air Force have been uh, pretty busy trying to help integrate our United States Space Force into the Department of the Air Force. Uh, any of you guys uh, plan on going into space, being space operators or doing anything in space? Yeah. All right, so that's, that's, a, that's been a huge deal for us and uh, very unique, you know, it's, it's been a long time uh, since we established a separate service. And uh, so lots of wheels turning, lots of people doing uh, lots of hard work, uh, trying to figure out from basic logistics uh, things on where, where we might put offices and uh, all the way to, you know, how the Space Force might organize. And one of the great things that I like about where we are, where the Space Force is as a part of the Department of Defense is they can choose to copy and be just like the Air Force and organize just like the Air Force, or uh, they can choose to establish their very own identity, their very, their very own way of organizing. Uh, you know, the one thing that will remain constant is the way that we do space war fighting. So that, that don't, won't necessarily change in how uh, they augment not only the Air Force, but the other services and the combatant commands 
to enable all the various things that we do uh, across the Department of Defense. But it's really, really interesting just watching uh, how the Space Force is growing. I'm very, very excited about uh, how, how, how we're doing that. Uh, one of the things that <clears throat> we really have uh, been, been wrestling with uh, over the last year and, and uh, something that I, I get asked about all the time, uh, something that we really need to kind of figure out is fitness. Like, what are we going to do with fitness? And I, I imagine you don't really have a problem here, right? Uh, you probably have a pretty good fitness program. You probably have time allotted during your, yes, no? Yes? <laughs> kind of, sort of? Right. I'm sure there's somebody around here that's making sure that you get your workout in, that you're putting the right things in your body, uh, that you get the right amount of sleep and and all that stuff. Yes. No. All right. We're all in the same boat. But but this is something that uh, we got to figure out. You know, someone someone uh, actually I, I get asked this question all the time. Hey, what is the Air Force's uh, what is the Air Force's culture with respect to fitness? And you tell me. Just blurt it out. What is? Never skip leg day. Anyone? Yeah, so that's the same response I get in audiences of folks, you know, all across the Air Force is, is to be honest, we don't really have a culture uh, 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 centered around fitness. We do most, most discussions in the Air Force, that, and you will find this, hopefully, maybe this will change by the time you guys graduate and, and, uh, and get out into the Air Force, but most of the culture and discussions around fitness in the Air Force are centered around the fitness test which is the basic di diagnostic test that we use to measure your basic level of fitness. Sometimes we try to uh, decide that, you know, we'll equate it to readiness to deploy and your ability to go down range and, and, and ruck and all this other stuff, but it, it doesn't, our basic fitness test uh, doesn't measure that. But just about any discussion that you have in the Air Force around fitness is centered around the fitness test. And there are some things that we need to really do with the fitness test. And I'm, I'm uh, excited about some of the challenges and some of the changes that we've been making. But where, what, what I'm really more excited about is uh, first and foremost, where, where I think our culture should be. This is what I think you and every airman in the United States Air Force should think of when you think about fitness. I think uh, the first thing that should come to mind is, hey, I'm an airman. And in order for me to perform optimally in whatever my job is, whether I'm a space operator, an intelligence analyst, a combat controller, a fighter pilot, or whatever it is that I decide to be in the Air Force, it doesn't matter. Fitness is a part of who I am. Fitness, nutrition, sleep, like in order for me to perform optimally, I have to take my own fitness serious. I don't need to be coaxed. I don't need a carrot. I don't need a stick. I don't need to be, uh, we all need encouragement and inspiration, so I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. But first and foremost, we all have to decide that, hey man, this is part of who I am, just as much as, as me being, again, a fighter pilot, a civil engineer, a communications person, a, you know, intel analyst or whatever it is, we have to take our own fitness serious first. The second thing is when all, when all of you graduate, you'll be in a, in a position of leadership. You might be flight commanders, what have you, but you will be in a position of leadership. <clears throat> Along with every individual, you, as leaders and all of the other leaders in the room have to decide that, you know what, if you're going to be a part of my formation, if you're going to be in my squadron, if you're going to be in my flight, if you're going to be in my section, if you're going to be in this division that I'm a part of, fitness will be a part of who we are and what we do. That will come in all different facets, though. It's not as easy as the Air Force saying, OK, we're going to make sure that everybody gets 
one hour or two hours or three hours or five hours a week of duty time for fitness, right? That just won't cut it. We've tried that in the past. And in some cases that might work. And in most cases it won't work, right? Because there will be all kinds of challenges that people have. There'll be all kinds of challenges from a mission standpoint. So we'll leave it up to you as leaders to decide what does that mean? If you're in a flying squadron, it might mean one thing. If you're in a a, a medical squadron, it might mean something different, but it's, I, I'll, I'll leave it up to you to use all the tools that you've learned during your time here and all the things that you'll learn about leadership and human behavior and developing people to find the right balance and the right mix of, hey, how do we ensure that people that work in my formation, like you have to decide that this is part of my responsibility. This is not, I wish the Air Force would do this or that. If you work in this section, hey, we're going to take this time. We're going to talk about fitness. We're going to take time in the mornings or in the afternoons or whatever is most convenient for the schedule. And we are going to make sure that people are, are fit. Sounds pretty simple. But if it was, we'd already be doing it and I wouldn't be having this discussion that I actually hate to have. But I know somebody was going to bring it up. So I just wanted to get it out there first. Let's talk a little bit about readiness. Let's talk about personal readiness first. Of the almost 600,000 total force members in the United States Air Force, how many of them do you think are non-deployable at any given moment? What percentage? Forty-one? Five? Two? 25 percent. Zero. Zero. You think everybody is. Uh... <laughs> so only about four point six five percent, which is pretty, pretty good. Um, so we're doing pretty good from a personal readiness standpoint um, in terms of uh, our weapon systems. You know, for a long time, we measured readiness um, just kind of peanut butter spread across the board. So F-15, F-16, F-22, C-130, you, you name it, you know, all the resources and the way we measured readiness was kind of a peanut butter spread. A few years ago, based upon what's happening in the world, the, the guidance that we got from our national defense strategy, uh, we decided to do things a little bit different. We established what we consider pacing units. So these are units in the Air Force that, depending on the part of the world, uh, where things might be happening, these are the units that will be first to go. Some of you will graduate from here and you will become a part of one of these pacing units. So these are the most important units that we would need in the first days of conflict, whether it's in the Middle East or in the Pacific or in Europe, South America, you name it. And we decided that, hey, we will resource these units primarily first to make sure that they have the training, the equipment, the manning, all the resources that, that they need. And we sit at about around 90% uh, readiness rate with, with those units. So I don't, I don't really have any challenges uh, that I'm really concerned about from a, uh, a readiness standpoint. Big thing that's happening in the Air Force right now. I talked a little bit about this last year, still, still a huge challenge for us. I'm interested in your thoughts about it, uh, suicide. Last year, we had a 30% increase in suicides, total force, active duty, guard, reserve, and civilians. We normally have about 100 or so suicides in the, in the Air Force, which is, which is a lot. Uh, last year, we had about 130, 132 or so. I wish I had some magic dust. I wish I had a magic pill. Um, I wish I even had an answer for why this, this might be happening. What I do know is, you know, as you know, the theme centered around the human condition and culture, uh, I think this is extremely important as it relates to this particular topic. You will have airmen in the organizations that you lead that will wake up every single day and they will think to themselves one of two thoughts. They will wake up in the morning and they will think, 
you know what, I hate this job. And I hate the people in this organization. And I hate the lieutenant. And I hate the commander. And nobody cares about my situation. And nobody has spent the time to figure out what's going on in my life. And we're not a team. And I don't really understand our purpose and so on and so forth. This is not far fetched. This is this happens. Airmen in our United States Air Force right now wake up every day with some semblance of those thoughts. And then there are other airmen who wake up and they say to themselves, you know what? I love my job and I love my lieutenant and I love the commander and the chief and I love what we stand for. We have purpose. We work together as a team. You know, I was challenged a few months ago with this family situation or with this really heavy thing that's been on my mind. My team rallied around me. They made me feel like I was the most important person in the world. I had to take time off work, but it was okay. I didn't get ridiculed. People called and checked on me. They made sure that I was doing okay. Man, I love this job. My challenge to you is do everything in your power to create the environment for that second airman. Do everything in your power to create that environment for that second airman. There's no guarantees that that will stop people from taking their own lives. But it would help it will help them feel more connected. It would help them feel like they belong to a part of something that's special, or a part of something that's bigger than themselves. And it reinforces this age old kind of theory and philosophy that says, and I'm sure you've heard this, and, and most of us, when we hear this, we think, uh, yeah, I've heard that. It's kind of cliche. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care you would not believe how much difference that makes in people's ability to perform and do the job that the Air Force has trained them to do. You know, I recently read Simon Sinek's uh, The Infinite Game. And for a long time, I thought and, and in this, 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 this book, you know, he talks about the difference between a, a finite game, something that you win, football, basketball, baseball, and an infinite game. You know, in, in some cases, the wars that we, we fight and uh, the cure for cancer and some of these other things is, hey, in, with infinite games, there's no winning. You can't win. And for a long time, I thought when it came to suicide, hey, this is how we win. This is how we eradicate suicide and how we eradicate this thing that's, that's been plaguing our Air Force. But I begin to change my mind a little bit about, man, how do we put people in the best position to deal with this, to deal with the challenges that we all have in life? And this is, this is tough. This is something that I wish I could say, hey, by the time you graduate, man, we won't have this problem. We will have won this battle and we won't have this problem. But I think you and I both know that this is this is something that uh, we all go through. We all deal with. Sometimes we have these thoughts. But I firmly believe that you and I, by creating the right types of culture and by showing people that we care about them, we can help them deal with the challenges. We can help them get the help that they need. And we can over time slowly but surely improve this condition specifically for us in our, our Air Force. I'll spend my, my last year as your chief Really, uh, you know, I, got, I get a lot of feedback from our airmen across the Air Force about uh, things that, that they want to see. 
uh, bereavement leave and, and a few other things. So, so I'll continue working on maybe tying up loose ends is a, is a better way to do it, to try to make sure that all of our airmen have the things that they need, that they're in the best position to succeed. So that'll, that'll keep me relatively busy. One big thing that I've been working on is transforming our enlisted evaluation system. So hopefully by the time that you graduate and you have to supervise enlisted airmen, uh, this will, will have all of this, this, this figured out. I'll be happy to go into it if anybody has questions about what, what we might be doing. But I'll just clue you in on one of the things that we've been doing is, man, we've been to Google, we've been to Amazon, we've been to some of the major corporations and we've watched how they do provide feedback, how they do performance uh, reporting and, a, and, and the culture that they, um, have created and we've gotten some really good ideas. Some of the things I think can work in our Air Force and, and some of them uh, may not work in the Air Force. All right, let me give you a little bit of leadership advice and then I'll turn it over to you for any questions that you might have for me. So I'm almost certain that all week you'll be getting leadership advice. Uh, you've probably been getting a lot of leadership advice <clears throat> during your time here and you'll get many more uh, between now and the time that, that you graduate. But uh, I just want to pass along, I, I think, three things that are important to your role and, and responsibilities as leaders. And the first thing is be authentic. Right. Be authentic. You can only be yourself. Everybody else is already taken. This is what people and, and the, the, the funny thing about this is, at least for you, it's a little bit different for myself. And, you know, my peers is most of most of the people that you will be leading will be your peers. In age, they may not be your peers in rank, but they'll be your peers in in age and somewhat in experience. Many of them will have went to college and, and maybe even finished college. Some of them will be like me. They will have went to college for three, three or four years and they will have, you know, an experience very, very similar to yours. And one thing, just like you guys, one thing that they can spot is someone that's being fake. And so you have to be you and you have to take advantage of the natural gifts that you have. Not every one of you will be a, a gifted orator that will be able to stand up in front of people and deliver these you know, great speeches, nor will you necessarily have to. Not every one of you will be gifted in understanding human behavior and and counseling and, and all these other things. You have to figure out, hey, what am I good at? What are my strengths? And let me capitalize on the things that I'm really good at. You need to understand your weaknesses or your, the areas that you need to improve as well so that you can figure out and, and always put yourself in a position to try to get better. But this is what I can tell you. This is what I've learned over the years. You can really only perform, you can really only perform and especially perform well from a place of strength. And so you have to understand you, you have to understand uh, what you're good at, capitalize on those strengths and use them to make a, the, the best impact that you can on the airmen that you will be responsible for. But you gotta be yourself. Like I'm unapologetically me. I like what I like. I'm probably not the ideal, maybe I wasn't the ideal person to be the chief master sergeant of the Air Force. I think I've done okay in the job. But I, I am who I am and I, and I like what I like. And it doesn't mean that I'm reckless. It doesn't mean that I just say what's on. There are many times when I have things on my mind and I, I'm smart enough to say, at least now, I wasn't always smart enough to not just blurt out, hey, this is what I'm thinking. So I don't mean be reckless and, and all that. So you got to understand your, like I said, your weaknesses as well. But just be yourself, right? That's what airmen want to see. They want to see you. And for example, if an airman comes to you and they ask a question and you don't know, don't pretend, don't puff your chest out and pretend like you do. Don't tap dance around and make up some answer. It's perfectly okay to say, you know what, Airman Johnson, I don't know, but here's how we're going to find out. Now, if every time they come to you and ask a question, you say, oh, I don't know, okay, that's probably something that you need to work work on, making sure that you understand your, your job a little bit better. But just first and foremost, be authentic. The second thing that I would tell you is learn to squint with your ears. 
This will be a little bit challenging. Squinting with your ears is just like squinting with your eyes, right? When you're squinting with your eyes, you're really, really trying to see whatever it is that you might be looking at. Squinting with your ears means that, hey, I'm really, really trying to listen. I'm really, really trying to understand what challenges you have. So you'll be in this position where you will be the newest, freshest, and in some cases, the youngest person in the unit, but you'll be in charge. And it'll be very easy to decide for yourself, hey, I'm the lieutenant, I'm in charge here. I went to the United States Air Force Academy. Let me tell you how we're gonna do this. And there will be times when you will need to establish this fact that yes, I am the flight chief. Yes, I am the decision maker when it comes to whatever it is that I'm, I'm responsible for. But there's nothing like, there's nothing like a leader who listens. A leader who listens and listens for other people's viewpoints and listens to try to understand what challenges we have. This is particularly in, in, in respect to your airmen that might have their own personal challenges. So this, you're going to have airmen that, that will uh, lash out. You're going to have airmen that will be like me. Uh, she, she mentioned something about early in my career or something. I, you, I was your worst nightmare when I was an airman because I didn't listen. I like to come to work late. I like to drink. I like to have a good time. And work was the last thing on my mind. And I cursed out everybody in my path. Captain, Lieutenant, Master Sergeant, everybody. And so you're going to have airmen that will, they might not be as bad as I was, but you're going to have airmen uh, that won't be excited and won't be jumping at every chance to, to, to follow you and do the, do the things that you say. All those airmen, you know, our former chief of staff, General Welsh, used to say, hey, every airman has a story. And, and, I, and I think in order for you to understand that story, to best lead those types of airmen, you got to listen. You got to squint with your ears. Third thing that I think you should do as a leader is leaders are learners, right? You got to become a lifelong learner. Leadership is not something you're not going to graduate from here. And yep, your cup might be filled on graduation day. And you might think like, wow, man, I got a lot of tools. I got a lot of things, but it'll, it will quickly begin to diminish as you get out in life and as you get out in the Air Force. So you got to dedicate yourself to, you know, continue learning. And you don't always need a class. You don't need, you don't always need the Air Force to send you to some program. especially with technology today, Audible, the various podcasts and, and all of those things. Just dedicate yourself to being a lifelong learner, not just about your job, your particular job, but about leadership and human behavior and the human condition and how to create and establish cultures in your workplace. All those things will make a huge difference in your success as you get out into our United States Air Force. So that's kind of what I've been up to. That's my three pieces of leadership advice. What's on your mind? What are you guys thinking about? And if you're not thinking about anything, that's fine. Uh, I've been here before, I've, I've seen this. And I'll let you guys get back to partying and drinking or whatever you do in uh... <laughs> this is college, right? Good evening, Chief. I'm Cadet First Class Megan Irvine from CS30. My question was, given the advice you just gave us, how are we supposed to apply that if we're leading hundreds of airmen right out the get-go? If, if you're leading what now? Up to hundreds of airmen. Um, depending on your career field, most of you won't have to lead hundreds of airmen, but let's just say you do, right? So if you're going to be a maintenance officer, there's a chance yes, that you will have, is that you? Yes, right? sir. There's a chance that you will have hundreds of, of airmen. 
So this is where you have to leverage the team that you have. So you might have hundreds of airmen that you're responsible for, but somewhere in that between you and those airmen will be uh, quite a few master sergeants, senior master sergeants, uh, maybe even a chief and tech sergeants and, and, and on down. And what you have to do is make sure that you leverage, you, you, uh, most of your responsibility will be to that team, to that team of master sergeants and tech sergeants and making sure that they have your vision, that they have the skills and the things that they need to help all the airmen that will be in your case out on the flight line or in the, in, in the back shops. <clears throat> I, I wouldn't try, uh, it's never a good idea to say, okay, I'm gonna go out and personally try to get to know every single one of, one of these airmen. If that happens over time, I, I think that's great, but you have to focus again on where you think you can make the, the, the biggest difference. Okay, thank you, Chief. Mm -hmm. Good evening, Chief. I am Cadet Third Class William DeRubio of Cadet Squadron 25. As we begin transitioning from focusing on VEOs to near peer adversaries, how do you suggest that we mentor and lead our airmen as we start moving towards a more formidable foe? Yeah, so most of your airmen, hell, most of us, all of us that have been in the Air Force have been, uh, I won't say solely focused, but a majority of airmen have been focused on, like you mentioned, the VEO fight, the Middle East and, 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 and the things that's been happening in Iraq and Afghanistan and, and, and all that, that stuff. Uh, as we transition in the future to uh, what we would consider peer, our peer adversaries, what, what, I, what I would encourage you to do is make sure airmen have an open mind and are thinking differently about what conflict might mean with Russia or China or even Iran, North Korea. I, I, the, the biggest, when it comes to tactics, so, so most of your airmen will be really good at um, tactics, right? H how we might go about fighting these battles uh, as we integrate uh, concepts like agile combat employment and, and a few other things. Airmen won't have any challenges with that, right? They won't have any challenges with, hey, you want us to do something uh, different from a tactical standpoint. You have to get them thinking differently about what war looks like, what it, what it might mean, how it might be different, how deployments might be different. Uh, one of the things that, that I would encourage uh, not just you to think about, but get your airmen thinking about is what, what's referred to in the, in the joint world as mission command. And this is kind of, we kind of know it as decentralized command. Imagine being in some foreign nation you have a mission and you have been cut off from your higher headquarters. And it's up to you, Lieutenant, and the small team that you have to, to one, first and foremost, make sure that you understand the guidance and the vision of the, the, your higher level command. And then you have to decide. You can't sit around and wait for some call that might not ever come. That means you have to take some risk. There's gonna be a little bit of encourage, I mean, a little bit of courage. Uh, there's going to be some fear. There's going to be, you know, lots of things going through your mind. But that's what I think most of our airmen need to start thinking about and preparing for is this idea that we won't fight wars in the past like we have done uh, we won't, in the future like we have done in the, in the past. Thank you, Chief. Yep. Good evening, Chief. I'm Cadet First Class Alejandro Villanueva from Cadet Squadron 19. You mentioned earlier that you weren't the perfect model airman when you came into the Air Force. Now, as the Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, you clearly had a turning point in your career. Um, how do you suggest specifically that we provide that turning point for other airmen, and in your case specifically, what was that turning point? Yeah, so the way that you provide that turning point, because there's, I tell you what, there are lots of airmen that are just like me. There are lots of airmen that are just like me. There are lots of airmen that were like me that got kicked out during my time. There are lots of airmen between the time that I came in and right now that didn't do so well. You gotta get to know the people that work for you. You have to show them that you care. The, I, I would say what, what, what one of the things that you will have to learn is patience. 
Because if someone is a, a bad apple, let's just say like I was, one conversation is not going to turn them around. You're not going to scare them stiff or scare them straight with one conversation. You're not going to uh, take them to lunch one time or have coffee one time and, and then they'll decide, oh, wow, this is great. I think I'll you know, do, do better now. So you have to really be patient. You have to really spend time getting to know and understand their story, understand their background and figure, figure out, hey, where, where is this behavior coming from? What, what's causing you to, to think like this, to, to act like this? <clears throat> You'll be amazed at once you build trust, how people might open up to you. And then you're in a much better position to use all the tools that are available to you to help them become a better person. For me, I had a supervisor. He was really tough on me, which is what I needed, right? I needed a father figure, I needed a coach, and he was exactly that for me. But what turned me around was uh, he made me join the base honor guard. So I joined the base honor guard and I started doing funerals and I, I, I kind of had to get my act together. I had to start wearing my uniform properly, but Essentially, and I, I believe I told this story last year during, the, during my presentation, I, I got to present a flag uh, to a next of kin. And I, when I locked eye contact with the, the lady that I was pre presenting this flag, <clears throat> I started crying and I didn't cry, man. I was hard, I was a G, right? I didn't, I didn't cry for nobody. <laughs> but I started crying and I realized, hey man, you, and I, 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 I literally said to myself, you have to get your act together. You gotta take your career and your life more, more serious. And then I, I, that was the beginning of my, my 180 uh, that got me here today. Thank you, Chief. Yeah. How you doing, Chief? Thank you again uh, for granting us 12 outstanding airmen this opportunity as a Mass Sergeant Brown. Brown. So how are you doing? Yes, sir. What's up, man? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, through this opportunity for uh, giving us this chance to speak with the cadets, uh, there's been a common theme that I've had questions about, and I would like for you to address it in this forum. One of the questions that was presented to me was talking about the mental stability of the airmen. Uh, we understand we're trying to get at after suicide, and we're not going to be able to stop that 100%. But how is the Air Force addressing the mental stability of airmen, and as these individuals come in as leaders, how do they help moving that forward? You know, that's a very vague that's a very vague thought, the mental stability of of airmen. So how would you classify the mental stability of airmen? Would you classify it as, hey, airmen in the Air Force are very stable, airmen in the Air Force are very unstable or somewhere in the middle? And the real answer is, it depends, All right? So there are airmen in our Air Force that are, have been through you know, some very challenging times and are very mentally stable or have, haven't been through any challenging times and are very mentally you know, uh, stable. The way that you, I'll go back to the answer that I gave the cadet, the last question is, the way that you even figure this out, that an airman is mentally unstable is, you gotta spend the time, you gotta get to know them, you gotta make sure you understand where they're coming from, their background, the things that they're going through, the challenges that they have, the goals that they have in life, so that you can be in the best position to help them succeed. The Air Force is investing heavily in resources. We, we have a program, uh, it's called, it used to be called Task Force True North. Now it's just called True North as we transition away from it being this, this kind of beta test thing. But really it's designed, and it was modeled after our uh, Special Operations Command POTIF program, Preservation of the Force and Family. The basic theory is that instead of having psychologists, psychiatrists, mental health professionals um, to include uh, service animals, you know, 
the, the gamut of helping resources that someone who is mentally unstable might, might need. Uh, instead of having these folks at the hospital somewhere else on base, they're actually embedded in the squadron. And so we started off with five bases. I think we were adding 13 additional bases. I wish, I wish that we could put a chaplain, a psychiatrist, a, uh, a military family life consultant, and all of those. I wish we could put one in every single squadron, but we can't. Nor do I believe it would necessarily solve some of the challenges that our, our airmen are have. So this is a combination of, hey, big Air Force uh, is investing in the resources that we think people need and what, what you would consider an, a mentally unstable airman to get them the help that they, the professional help that, that they need. But the other part of the equation is folks like yourself, Brown, that have to be, that must be inspiring, encouraging, motivating, caring leaders that can help people with some of the challenges, challenges that they might have. So I, I would say it's a combination of big Air Force, but a huge responsibility on those of you who are out in the Air Force that are charged with leading these airmen. Thank you, Chief. Appreciate yeah. it. Yes, sir. Good evening, Chief. I'm uh, Cadet William Watkins from DET 105 at the University of Colorado Boulder. Given the fact that the Air Force has taken care of space operations in the past, do you foresee the Space Force um, being a subset of the Air Force, like the Marine Corps is of the Navy, or do you believe that the Space Force is going to separate, become its own uh, department? Well, it already is. Oh. Right? So that's exactly... Well, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, exactly as you described it. Department of the Air Force, just like there's a Department of the Navy, Air Force, Space Force, just like in the Department of the Navy, United States Navy, United States Marine Corps. So same exact thing. It is a separate service. They just both fall under the Department of the Air Force. Sir, I guess, I guess my question is, do you foresee in the future uh, the two separating then? No. Okay. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Thank you, Chief. Yeah, man. He just need a hug, man. He just need a hug. Good evening, Chief. Cadet Third Class Simmons, CS37. Uh, Chief, as you may know, uh, weak. you are known pretty commonly throughout the enlisted force as enlisted Jesus. Chief, I just uh, I was curious, what is it like being called something like that, and uh, how, do you, how do you stay humble and hardworking in your, in your position? What was the second part of your question, man? Chief, how do you stay humble and hardworking? Oh, okay, yeah, that's actually good. <laughs> uh, it's extremely, it is extremely humbling to be referred to in those terms. <laughs> like, no, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. Um, but just like having a certain rank, being a chief or being a general or you know, whatever it is. Uh, humility is, an, is a really, really important part of, of being, being a leader. And you can't let it go to your head, just like you can't let the perks that come with certain leadership positions, you can't let it go to your head and you can't let it change who you are. Uh, one of the things that I pride myself on is this idea that, man, I've never, ever, ever forgotten where I came from. I, I never forgot what it's like as a child to have nothing to have to eat syrup and sugar sandwiches. I've never forgotten what it's like to be an airman and not have a voice. I've never forgotten what it's like to be pulled off a stage, like you don't even matter. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I think it's, it's relatively, I won't say it's easy. Uh, it does take work to, to, to stay humble, 
but uh, I, I'll, I'll just say I really do appreciate the sentiment from our Air Force and the Airmen. Uh, I, but I always say this when it comes to this topic. Uh, it doesn't offend me, but I, I just encourage airmen to think about when they're saying it or when they're uh, creating these memes that it could be offensive to people uh, from a religious standpoint. And sir, we do yeah. have time for one last question. We got time for one last question. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chief. Good evening, Chief. I'm Cadet Edie from University of Colorado, Colorado Springs at Debt 105. Sir, you talked about living authentically and being authentic in a leadership position. How do you balance that authenticity with also being professional? Yeah, so that's a, that's a, a really good question. I'll just tell you a little bit about, about me. I like golf. I like scotch. I like cigars. I have friends. I have friends that are senior officers. I have friends that are cadets. I have friends that are young, young airmen. It's just who I am. It's just how I see the world is how I think about life. I don't, I don't necessarily like barriers. I understand the importance of professionalism. Um, I, I would never put my, myself in a position where uh, I would say anything or do anything that would be considered unprofessional. So I, so I think it takes, uh, to get to the root of your question, it takes a little bit of self-awareness. So there's, there's one thing to, to, hey, this is just me. I, I just like hanging out and drinking with, you know, young, young airmen, or I like saying whatever it is that's on my mind and whatnot. Uh, there, there is like a, a, a fine line between maintaining your professionalism and just and being who you are. So a, a big part of it, I would, I would say, is you have to understand you. You have to understand you, you have to understand your strengths and weaknesses, like I mentioned earlier. And then you have to be open to, to feedback. You have to be open to whether it's your colleagues, your peers, your airmen, uh, your supervisor, uh, allowing them to tell you, hey, this, I think this is fine, it's great that you like golf or that you like volleyball, uh, but you are still a lieutenant in the United States Air Force and you need to make sure that you maintain uh, these professional lines when it comes to other volleyball players who may not be officers uh, or who may not be appropriate for you to spend time, time with. Thank you, Chief. All right, that's my time? Sir. You got to say something else? I do. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, Chief Wright, thank you for your message and for participating in this, <laughs> in this year's NCLS. We thank you for your insights and hope to learn from your experiences about what it truly means to be a team member and, and leader, leader who values, values human, human conditions, conditions, cultures, and societies. <laughs> see you. Yeah, okay. we'll skip that part. You want to skip that part? Yeah, see ya. That was where I told you to move on to questions, but you moved on on your own. I moved so on I, on my own, okay. Very self-sufficient, so. <laughs> so we, we, are, we skipped. We already did we that. We already did that. Last questions, so, please, yeah. So, thank you again, Chief Wright. <laughs> on behalf of the Cadet Wing and NCLS staff, we would like to present you with this small token of our appreciation. Which All right. <laughs> <laughs> ah! My man. All right, thank you. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. All right. <laughs> we'll talk about social media if you want to continue. <laughs> we'll talk social media? Okay. We're going to talk social media now. All right. So during this year's NCLS, there's a special emphasis to get social and share your experience in real time. 
We encourage you to connect on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook with the hashtag NCLS2020. Each day, our public affairs team will be pulling your photos, stories, and quotes from these platforms to share on the big screen in Arnold Hall, like you see here tonight. We will also be broadcasting your shared images and quotes worldwide during live stream events. You were live stream. Yeah. We hope you enjoy <laughs> the 27th Annual National Character and Leadership Symposium. Take advantage of the opportunity and enjoy our amazing speakers. Thank you for attending the Cadet Wing kickoff. You are dismissed. <laughs> <laughs>